sessions. This is hearing number 52. May I say perhaps a historic hearing, impact of extractive industries on the sacred sites of indigenous peoples in the United States. I am Rosemary Antoine, president of the commission. To my left, I have with me uh, the rapporteur for the United States and rapporteur for migrant peoples, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez. To my left, I have Commissioner Rosa Maria Ortiz, who's a rapporteur on the rights of children. And to the far left, we have with us our assistant executive secretary, who's responsible for our legal team. Uh, I, just, I almost said commissioner, but Elizabeth, happy <laughs> Meshad. I want to welcome um, all of you, the state of the United States, who is again joining us. They have several hearings today, and we very much appreciate their full attention and presence uh, with the persons who have all of the answers uh, to the questions. And I'm extremely pleased also to welcome those who requested this hearing, uh, which was requested by the Navajo Nation, the Laguna Pueblo, San Carlos Apache Nation and the Intertribal Council of Arizona Incorporated. The participants that I have listed here, Leonardo Gorman, an executive director of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, Ora V. Marek Martinez uh, of the same, um, Venaldo Grant, historic preservation officer, San Carlos Apache Nation, and David Martinez, First Lieutenant Government, Governor of the Laguna Pueblo. If I've left out anyone, please introduce yourselves or if anything has changed. As always, we give 20 minutes each on each side, after which we will ask some questions or comments and then hopefully have some more interaction if there is time. So please begin. Yate. <coughs> Good morning, distinguished members of the Commission, the Secretariat, and representatives of the United States government. Thank you for the meeting with us this morning. We requested this hearing to discuss the U.S.'s failure to protect indigenous peoples' sacred places from extractive industries and other development activities and to encourage the United States to comply with, op with its obligations under the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, specifically the right to religion, the right to culture, and the right to judicial protection, as well as other human rights instruments to which the United States is bound. Our presentation will discuss, will focus on the ongoing nature of the spiritual, cultural, and physical the desecration of sacred places and address the flaws and shortcomings of the United States federal Indian law and policy. As detailed in our petition to the Commission, domestic mechanisms available to indigenous peoples in the United States for the protection of sacred places are simply ineffective. The United States courts have taken a restrictive view of the protection provided by the U.S. Constitution and federal law for religious freedom and related cultural rights. Under Supreme Court precedent, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution only protects against government actions that specifically target and are intended to suppress particular religions or religious practices, a standard that cannot be met by indigenous litigants seeking to protect the sanctity of sacred places, as made clear by numerous judicial decisions denying protection of sacred sites under the First Amendment. The Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act has also proven to be ineffective because of its discriminatory application to indigenous peoples. The appeals court in the Navajo Nation case cited Supreme Court precedent that, quote, the diminishment of spiritual fulfillment, serious though it may be, is not a substantive burden on the free exercise of religion, unquote. Furthermore, the United States has issued legislation such as the in American Indian Religious Freedom Act and executive orders to protect indigenous peoples religious rights and access to sacred sites. However, these have been interpreted to be primarily procedural and provide no legal actionable rights. This, is, this issue has also been taken up by UN mechanisms and bodies and we call upon the Commission to urge the United States to implement their recommendations, specifically this report of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The concluding observations of the Human Rights Commission and the observations of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. In addition, we ask the Commission to urge the United States to, one, 
implement appropriate mechanisms by which indigenous peoples in the United States are consulted with the view to obtaining our free, prior, and informed consent by state actions that affect our sacred places in accordance with international human rights standards. Two, ensure that any actions or decisions of government agencies affecting indigenous sacred places, landscapes, and areas of significance are in accord with not just domestic law, but also international standards such as the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man, protecting the rights of indigenous peoples, <coughs> agency, and autonomy over religious traditions. And three, enact necessary administrative, judicial, legislative mechanisms in consultation with indigenous peoples to adequately and effectively protect our sacred places under federal and state jurisdictions, taking into account our ec economic and social characteristics and our customary law, values, and traditional practices. Since uh, in, in ensure that these mechanisms conform to international human rights standards, such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 19. And I have the Navajo Nation, San Carlos Na Apache Nation, and Pueblo uh, of Laguna, who will discuss the impacts on sacred places on extractive industries, uh, by extractive industries and other uh, development activities. At AHA, Dr. Ora Merrick Martinez, Yenche, Tisla Ninishli, Donimi Pui Pak de Se Bashishin, Arokis Ani E Dashe Do Belagane Dashnale, Akut Ego Es San Inishli. Hello, my name is Dr. Ora Merrick Martinez. And before I begin, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of the traditional users of the land that we are currently on. Yeah, thank you. I am here <clears throat> with the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department as a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer being the official representative to speak on behalf of the Navajo people. We are here to testify to the adverse effects of the artificial snowmaking on the San Francisco peaks, or Doko Slid as we call them, <clears throat> by the Snowball Ski Resort and its effects on the Navajo people, on our spiritual and cultural beliefs. <clears throat> In Navajo prayers, we begin with an acknowledgement of our holy people, our gods. This recognition lays out the Navajo way of life and provides a context that Navajo spirituality is situated within a natural world. I would like to recognize and invoke these DN because of the esoteric nature of the topics we're speaking on today. Mother Earth, Father Sky, Female Mountains, Female Water God, Darkness, Dawn, Talking God, Home God, White Corn Boy, Yellow Corn Girl, Corn Pollen, and Corn Beetle. Yeah. The Snowball Ski Resort operates under a special use permit with the, issued by the United States Department of Agriculture Forest Service, who is responsible for managing the land that the San Francisco Peaks is comprised of. The use of reclaimed wastewater was approved by the city of Flagstaff to create artificial snow on the San Francisco Peaks. This was approved by the city without free and prior informed consent by the Navajo Nation and other indigenous peoples within the region. Although the Navajo people have opposed such actions, our rights are continually violated without redress. As a sovereign nation, the Navajo have a right to consult with federal agencies on activities that have the potential to adversely affect cultural resources, places, and cultural landscapes under the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. The designation of the San Francisco Peaks is eligible for protection under the National Register of Historic Places as a traditional cultural property <coughs> has provided no remedy for the desecration of the mountain. In Navajo cosmology, we refer to our land base as Denebekeya, which formulates the foundation of our Navajo lifeways and represents our homelands as a beating heart, which lies within the body of the sacred landscape. This area is demarcated by four sacred mountains. These mountains provide the Navajo people with a philosophical understanding of the natural order or the Navajo way of life. In order for the body to function, it requires a heart to beat and pump blood. The Nebekeya, our land base, is that heart, which is essential to the very existence of Navajo lifeways and culture. The mountains then are similar to the chambers of the heart. In order for the heart to function, it needs all these functioning chambers to work. As such, the San Francisco Peaks is a functioning chamber of the heart of the sacred landscape. 
This requires the utmost purity and pristineness. The San Francisco peaks are the life force of the holy people, our medicine bundles, <clears throat> our prayers, and our ceremony. Our medicine bundles represent the entire universe. They encapsulate all of the most holy aspects of our universe, which incorporates the ritual collection of soil, plants, and animals from the San Francisco peaks and our other sacred mountains. Our bundles represent our past, our present, and our future. They represent the connections that we maintain with our holy people, that we maintain from the first world that we came out of all the way up into the fifth world, this world. If the San Francisco peaks continue to be desecrated, the purity for the, required for the balance that is necessary for a Navajo way of life ceases. This delicate balance is sought through the ceremonies performed at the San Francisco peaks. The peaks themselves are medicine for the Navajo people. They are a significant component of the everyday life, everyday prayers of every Navajo who prays to welcome the dawn, the beginning of a new day. The use of reclaimed wastewater, sewage effluent, to create artificial snow on the San Francisco peaks is an affront to the cultural and spiritual integrity of the Navajo people. Specifically, the use of human waste to create artificial snow is in complete opposition to the ritual purity required for our ceremonial cycles. Although this action is isolated on one part of the mountain, we believe that everything is connected. All of us are relatives. All of us feel one disturbance no matter where it happens. It resonates with all of us. This then affects the cumulative <coughs> This provide, the effects are cumulative then. They indirectly and directly affect the entire cultural landscape, which then affects the epistemological construction of the Navajo universe. These effects are a major concern to many medicine people as they have visited the Snowball and have witnessed the desecration to the mountain, which Commissioner Antoine visited this summer. <clears throat> the Navajo Nation has officially opposed any development of the San Francisco peaks based on the understanding of, of the mountain and has made this position known to the Forest Service and to the U.S. in detailed in the petition, which has been thor thoroughly litigated <coughs> since 1979, all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, which refused to review our case. If the chambers of this spiritual place cease to function, <clears throat> then our people our very existence, our ceremonies, our language, our very way of life will disappear. Thank you. Dagot M. She ever knelt a grant gunsa, I was not telling she, I was telling a punish team. Hello, my name is Vernelda Grant. I am, the, I am San Carlos Apache, and I am the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer of the San Carlos Apache Tribe located in southeastern Arizona. Oak Flat, Chichilip Dagotel, flat with acorn trees, is a place of profound religious, cultural, and historic significance to the Apache tribes and many other Native American tribes who live in southeastern Arizona. For centuries, the Apache, Yavapai, Hopi, and other tribes lived, prayed, and died in the Oak Flat area. At least eight Apache clans and two Western Apache bands have documented history in the area, proving that <coughs> excuse me, Apaches thrived with this, within this environment. Prior to being forced to live on reservations as prisoners of war by the United States in the late 1800s, the area contains a wealth of material remains and evidence that points to its importance to us as a people. For over 10 years, the Southeastern Arizona Land Exchange Bill, also known as the Oak Flat Apache Leap Land Exchange, was repackaged and presented to Congress 13 times, and each time failed to pass as a standalone bill. That law would give Oak Flat and the surrounding area to Resolution Copper, a mining company owned by foreign mining giants Rio Tinto PLC of the United Kingdom and the Australian company BHP Billiton Limited. Since 2005, the San Carlos Apache has gathered support from tribal and non-tribal organizations and formed a broad coalition of those opposed to the destruction of this place of worship, where Apaches have prayed, conducted religious ceremonies, gone for healing, and gathered medicinal plants and traditional foods. For more information, see the tribe's proclamation 
and the resolution from the National Congress of American Indians. We lobbied Congress tirelessly for over a decade not to destroy our sacred place. Then, in the waning hours of a lame duck session of Congress, our own Arizona congressman inserted the act as a provision into a must-pass military spending bill, where it was enacted by Congress as Section 3003 of the Carl Levin and Howard P. Buck McKeon National Defense Authorization Act, even though it has nothing to do with national defense. Section 3003 requires the Tonto National Forest in Arizona to convey 2,422 acres of public lands in Pinal County, Arizona to Resolution Copper to conduct a massive block cave copper mining project that would become the largest copper mine in North America. Archaeological sites, sacred sites, burial sites, and, and an irre irreplaceable spiritual gathering place for the Apache all will be destroyed by the mine's two-mile-wide subsidence crater left by block cave mining. These photos that you see depict the unique desert oasis of the Oak Flat and its surrounding areas, and the geographical impact zone, and subsidence occurring from block cave mining. An independent water study showed that the mine's colossal use of water will deplete the already strained water resources of the region and poison the water that all life relies upon. Resolution Copper is promising jobs to our community, but our economic studies show that these jobs are not going to materialize and that their promises of economic boom are grossly exaggerated. Resolution pub Resolution's public relations campaign actively tries to pit our tribal members against one another and attempts to dilute and confuse the voices of those who are speaking against the destruction of sacred and holy places. Without consulting the tribe, Section 3003 revoked a decades-old ban on mining by Presidents Eisenhower and Nixon within what was the 760-acre Oak Flat withdrawal area. Section 3003 circumvented federal laws designed to protect the environment and archaeological and historic sites because private land is not subject to the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, Executive Order 13007 and others. The United States Forest Service through Tonto National Forest as well as Rec Resolution Copper Company have failed to properly consult, coordinate, or obtain free and prior and, and con formed consent from the Apache people for the actions they are taking and sanctioning. The gamesmanship of the Tonto National Forest and Resolution Copper is meant to deny the Apache people their participation in a fair, independent, impartial, open and transparent process, which is a fundamental denial of our human rights. If mining companies can easily approach Congress behind closed doors, sacred and holy places important to the history and cultural lifeways of native peoples, the Apache the United, and the United States will be destroyed. Is the ultimate goal of the United States to destroy my people, my children, and our cultural lifeways? Thank you. Dollar straight drosk. Nah, nice chair. God's in the cool fish tie. Say, I eat you on the Matana. Oh, hit him at Ashro. Tiami Hanuk, the Shashko Ashji. Good morning, Honorable Commissioners. My name is David Martinez. I'm the first Lieutenant Governor for the Pueblo of Laguna, which is located in the central western part of the state of New Mexico. The Pueblo of Laguna has a land base of over 500,000 acres, which lie at the base of Mount Taylor. The Pueblo is most grateful for the opportunity to present to you our concerns and experiences regarding the failure of our trustee, the United States, to protect our sacred sites and cultural landscape from extractive industries and other development activities, including the failure to provide domestic legal protections. In our language, we know Mount Taylor as Spina. The majestic mountain rises to the northwest of our mother village of Laguna. Mount Taylor is a sacred place that is the home of deities, a source of precious water that sustains all life, and a resource for the collection of plants, animals, and minerals used in ritual and subsistence activities. Spina is identified by name in songs and prayers, and the mountain is used in teaching the children of the Pueblo about their history, culture, and identity. Spina is a part of our identity. Mount Taylor and our people are inseparable. In September of 2009, Mount Taylor was formally designated as a traditional cultural property under New Mexico state law. This status requires consultation with the Pueblo and other tribes. However, the state of New Mexico has not interpreted this to respect our, our right to say no to mining within the traditional cultural property. 
Mount Taylor is also listed on the National Register of Historic Properties under the National Historic Preservation Act, but the United States has not interpreted this listing to provide substantive protection from extractive industries. Instead, the United States insists that the antiquated 1872 Mining Act and other acts preference, preference extraction over protection of cultural resources. At Laguna, we've done our part by enacting a moratorium on any further, further mining. Mining and other intrusion into the area will result in the destruction of a sacred landscape which includes springs and places of worship, including burial and ancestral sites. The proposed Rokahanda mine, which would be located on the northwest slope of the sacred Mount Taylor, is our aboriginal homelands. We have demonstrated to the United States Forest Service and others that numerous shrines and places of worship are located in this area. This includes the home of our ancestors, where we believe the spirits of our ancestors are present and must not be disturbed. As an arm of the United States government, the United States Forest Service is bound by human rights obligations and international law to respect and protect the pueblos of Laguna's continuing relationship with these lands and resources. Article 23 of the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man and Article 21 of the American Convention on Human Rights, taken together, protect our rights to traditionally occupied lands and territories. Article 12 of the American Convention and Article 3 of the American Declaration protect the right of the Pueblo of Laguna to, exer to the exercise of our own religion, including access to sacred areas. This commission and the Inter-American Court have also applied rights enshrined in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Articles 11, 12, 13, 25, and 26 set forth rights related to culture and land of indigenous peoples. All of these rights taken together are implicated in proposed mining on Mount Taylor. Closely connected to Mount Taylor and under the threat from extractive activity is a World Heritage Site known as Chaco Cultural Natural Historic Park. Proposed underground fracturing for oil and gas production could damage or destroy fragile, irreplaceable prehistoric structures at Chaco Canyon. Like Mount Taylor, Chaco Canyon is a sanctuary needing protection from desecration, damage, and destruction. You've seen photos, and I've also provided the commission copies of photos that show the geographic area, which is the subject of my testimony. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present Laguna's concern and testimony. Thank you very much. You finished? Okay, thank you. You actually had an, a few more minutes, but I guess we could make it up with the questions time. Please. Thank you, distinguished commissioners, Madam Chair, members of the commission, and friends with us this morning. Good morning. My name is Mike Fitzpatrick, and I'm the interim permanent representative of the United States to the Organization of American States. I'm delighted to be here with you all today and join with my colleagues from the U.S. Department of Interior to discuss this most important matter before us today. In particular, we will be represented for the U.S. Government by Anne-Marie Bledsoe Downs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs for Policy and Economic Development at the U.S. Department of Interior. As part of her federal duties, she also facilitates operation of the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Ms. Bledsoe Downs has had a notable career working on these issues and has dedicated most of her career to working with indigenous communities within the United States. Ms. Bledsoe Downs has been a member of the Little Priest Tribal College since Board of Trustees since 2012 and was a member of the Ho-Chunk Incorporate in, uh, of the Ho-Chunk Incorporated Board of Directors from 2008 to 2013. She al also served as a member of the White House Initiative on Tribal Colleges and Universities Advisory Board from 2002 to 2005. She received her bachelor's degree in social science education from Wayne State College in 1991 and a Juris Doctorate from Arizona State University in 1994. Before I, sorry, before we get started, we acknowledge here that these issues are particularly complex, given the federal structure in the United States, as well as the status of U.S. federally recognized tribes, which are indeed sovereign nations within the U.S. constitutional system with their own governmental structures and property rights. Further, while the executive branch of the U.S. government has discretionary authority over a great deal of federal Indian policy implementation, some of the matters discussed here today are governed by laws passed by our Congress that allow for little or no discretion in the manner in which they are implemented by the executive branch. 
Moreover, in the presentation we just heard, there was a discussion of several specific situations. However, today, as part of this thematic hearing, we are here to talk about our policies broadly and generally to protect sacred sites in the United States. We would recall in this regard that this is a thematic hearing under Article 66 of the Commission's Rules of Procedures and not a petition-based hearing under Article 64. We are thus not in a, petition, in a position to discuss specific situations or answer questions about specific situations. While we are aware that the Navajo Nation, presented by Professors Howard and Williams, have indeed filed an individual petition with the Commission concerning the San Francisco Peaks, to our knowledge, the Commission has not yet forwarded the petition to the United States for our views. As such, it would be premature and inappropriate for us to provide any substantive views on this matter in this forum, which is, as I said, a thematic hearing. I thank you for the presentations that we have already heard this morning, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue. I will now turn the floor over to Ms. Bledsoe Downs, and I thank you very much for your participation today. Good morning, everyone. Distinguished commissioners, members of civil society, indigenous representatives, secretariat staff, and colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the protection of Native American sacred places in the United States in relation to extractive industries and other development activities. I appreciate the opportunity to make a statement for the United States government. I serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Economic Development in the Office of Assistant Secretary in Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. I'm an enrolled member of the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, and I serve as the lead for the White House Council on Native American Affairs, which is an interagency council of more than 30 federal agencies, departments established by President Obama by executive order in 2013. The Council's purpose is to promote and sustain prosperous and resilient Native American tribal governments by improving coordination of federal programs and the use of resources <coughs> available to tribal communities. I also assist in the coordination of President Obama's Generation Indigenous, or Gen I, initiative, which focuses on improving the lives of Native American youth through new investments and increased engagement. The administration has worked to strengthen the government-to-government -government relationship between the United States and tribal governments through a meaningful tribal consultation and support for tribal self-determination, recognizing that the best policies for Indian country come from Indian country. The White House has held the White House Tribal Nations Conference each year during the Obama administration. Leaders from each of the 567 federally recognized tribes are invited to Washington, D.C. to meet with the president, cabinet members, and other federal officials. Under Executive Order 13175, all federal agencies are required to establish regular and meaningful consultation and collaboration with tribal officials in the development of federal policies that have tribal implications in order to strengthen the United States government-to-government -government relationships with Indian tribes and to reduce the imposition of unfunded mandates upon Indian tribes. In 2009, President Obama signed a presidential memorandum directing all federal agencies to develop detailed plans of action to consult and coordinate with tribal governments. DOI Indian Affairs alone has held 99 tribal consultations during this administration. The administration's efforts to work more collaboratively with Indian tribes has resulted in federal tribal summits as well as state government, United States government meetings with Indian tribes. The U.S. Forest Service has for many years hosted an annual meeting with tribes in the southeastern U.S., and it has grown to include other federal agencies. In 2014, there were also federal tribal and state tribal summits in South Dakota, Washington, and Montana, during which sacred sites protection was among the topics discussed. In response to concerns about the destruction of sacred sites, the Departments of Interior, Agriculture, Defense, and Energy as well as the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, entered into a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, on December 5th of 2012 to work collaboratively to address the protection of and Indian access to sacred sites. A report documenting the signatory's progress on implementing the MOU and action plan was released in May of 2014. The signatories also recently released a policy statement on the confidentiality of sacred sites information a training proposal for federal employees, and an informa information paper for public outreach. 
The Department of Agriculture's Forest Service also released a final report reviewing law, policy, and procedures and providing recommendations in regard to Indian sacred sites in 2012. Both this final report and the above MOU were informed by and are being implemented through engagement with tribal leaders. On tribal lands, tribes generally have substantial authority over areas of spiritual and cultural significance through certain laws of general applicability, such as environmental laws, uh, though certain laws of general applicability, such as environmental laws, may apply. The tribe's management of spiritual and cultural areas on tribal lands are controlled by the tribe's laws and internal government processes. It is also important for the Commission to know that generally speaking, tribes own both the surface and subsurface of tribal lands and it is their decision whether to develop those resources. When tribes choose to develop their resources, it is with federal trustee oversight and guidance. U.S. law provides numerous protections for the rights of Native Americans as they pertain to areas of spiritual and cultural significance that are found on public lands. And it is long-standing executive branch policy to consider sacred sites in federal actions. Various executive actions have instructed all federal land managers to strive to accommodate access to ceremonial use of Native American sacred sites by Native American religious practitioners. To avoid aver adversely affecting the physical integrity of such sacred sites and where appropriate to maintain the confidentiality of sacred sites and to have an accountable process to ensure meaningful input by tribal officials in the development of regulatory policies that have tribal implications. These executive actions complement national laws and policies that serve to protect Native American sacred sites, such as the National Historic Preservation Act, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. The administration's policy has been to restore lands to tribes and to strengthen the tribal control over those lands. For example, we recently issued new regulations for the development of oil and gas using fracturing technology on federal lands. Those same regulations apply to Indian lands where tribes decide whether, when, and where energy sources may be developed on tribal lands. When development on, is on trust land, the project is coordinated with the federal trustee and is subject to federal law such as the National Environmental Policy Act. Interior's Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, is the federal agency that manages the largest amount of federal lands. The BLM manages 248 million acres and is responsible for 700 million acres of subsurface mineral resources. The BLM is working with tribes to help ensure that traditional sites and burials remain undisturbed and that cultural objects do not fall into the hands of private collectors. In 2014, BLM published four notices of intent to repatriate cultural items involving 291 cultural objects, two notices of inventory completion involving two sets of human remains and 271 cultural objects were also published. In September of 2014, four objects recovered through BLM law enforcement activities were returned to the Hopi in a very emotional repatriation. The President has also set, set aside certain lands of historical, cultural, and or significant scientific interest for federal protection by designating them as national monuments. Among the 13 monuments designated by President Obama, at least seven of them protect and honor places of spiritual and cultural importance to indigenous peoples. These designations set aside almost 2 million acres or 810,000 hectares across the western U.S. and New Mexico, California, Washington, Colorado, and Nevada. These recently designation, designated national monuments include the Rio Grande del Norte in New Mexico, this 242,000 or 500 acre area in the ancestral lands of Taos and Picarias Pueblos, Hickory Apache and Ute includes rock art and archaeological sites. The San Juan Islands in Washington, this monument protects archaeological sites of the Coast Salish people and is a 450 island archipelago of 1,000 acres or 405 hectares. Chimney Rock, Colorado is a 4,727-acre, 1,900-hectare ancestral Poblayan site that includes spiritual, historic, and scientific resources of great value and spiritual significance for the Pueblo communities. 
Also, the Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks in New Mexico contains 202,000 hectares, including archaeological and cultural sites. The San Gabriel Mountains in California, 140,000 hectares with rock art and archaeological sites. Browns Canyon, Colorado, an 8,700 8, hectare area, was designated in part to honor the area's native peoples. And finally, the Basin and Range National Monument in Nevada. The monument is a 704,000 acre or 285,000 hectare in the ancestral lands of the Western Shoshone and the Southern Paiute. It is one of the largest concentrations of petroglyphs and contains numerous archeological sites. Internationally, the United States has addressed its efforts to protect sacred sites through reports in the UN system including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and the Universal Periodic Review. In addition, the United States takes pride in supporting the outcome document from the 2014 UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, which includes affirming and recognizing the importance of indigenous peoples' religious and cultural sites, and setting forth a commitment for developing mechanisms for repatriation of sacred objects and human remains at the national and international levels. Thank you again for the opportunity to address the commission. Uh, thank you very much. I will now call on the Rapporteur for the U.S., Commissioner Gonzalez, to ask a few questions. Thanks, Madam President. I welcome both delegations uh, and uh, uh, thank their, their presentations at this, at this hearing. Um, there was one uh, aspect raised by the uh, U.S. government delegation uh, that presented the complexities of, uh, of these matters uh, from the legal point of view uh, in terms that, that the U.S., as we know, is a federal country, and uh, in addition that uh, some of the matters that uh, are at stake here uh, do not depend solely on the executive branch of uh, government, but also on legislation in place. And of course, the Commission is very much aware about the um, additional complexities that uh, um, that for federal states, that for federal countries in the OAS uh, um, are added to the to the to the to the obligations that uh, I mean the the complexities that that represent for the fulfillment of the obligations uh, under the Inter-American instruments. Now, having said that, of course, uh, it is the um, responsibility of the countries of the OAS to um, establish its structure in a way that uh, uh, might, might facilitate the, the fulfillment of uh, its obligations. And, um, and regarding the fact that uh, there might be um, some issues uh, regulated by legislation and not only by the by decrees uh, by the executive branch that are important here. Uh, I would like to ask uh, how indigenous peoples, uh, or what your experience is in this regard, or more generally the indigenous peoples in the United States participate in legislative uh, discussions of matters relevant to them. Um, because for the Commission, it's not only a matter of uh, um, monitoring uh, how the executive branch of the different states of the OAS uh, uh, behave, but also how the government as a whole, meaning all branches of power, um, accomplish their obligations according to international standards. So it would be important to know how the indigenous people participate at this uh, um, uh, at at, at, at legislative discussions on matters that are pertinent to them. Now, the government additionally said that uh, uh, it depends on tribes to decide where or not to explode uh, minerals, if I understood well. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I am missing something here, uh, but on the one hand, there are allegations on the part of the tribes that uh, the extractive uh, industries are uh, producing um, a series of uh, uh, 
undesirable consequences on sacred places, but at the same time, the government is saying that uh, uh, it depends on you, uh, on the indigenous people, to decide whether or not to go ahead with these uh, uh, industries. Is it that uh, for the government to uh, monitor how the, the industries uh, behave? Is that the issue at stake? I didn't understand quite well, so I would like to ask you both delegations if I can provide more information on this. Thanks. Commissioner Ortiz. Uh, we may want to use our... Um, sí, voy a hablar en español. It's on channel muy, seven. Muy cortito. Eh, también agradecer por agradecer por traer este tema a esta audiencia muy bienvenidos eh, y también a, a los representantes del estado por la información brindada eh, no voy a repetir lo dicho por mi colega más que preguntar de qué manera cuando los intereses de los pueblos indígenas eh, se ven afectados por otros intereses que, que tienen mucho más fuerza como las industrias extractivas. Eh, ¿Cómo reciben ellos la protección jurídica de parte del Estado suficiente para enfrentar esos intereses? Gracias. Thank you very much. I had a couple comments as well. I think it's it's very clear under international human rights law that we recognize the spiritual dimensions of indigenous rights and that they are in, intricately connected to the environment. That's well established, is well recognized. And I think it's also clear from what we have heard today uh, that there has been a failure to acknowledge the deep spiritual dimensions of these spaces, the particular spaces, the four sacred mountains in particular, at least in any meaningful way. And I did have the honor to visit uh, these spiritual and sacred sites a uh, couple months ago and to have a, a very deep learning exercise. I had the privilege, for example, of a lengthy video, which unfortunately we didn't have the time today to look at. We're going into detail how these sites are sacred uh, to indigenous peoples that are here and more today. Uh, and I think it's also clear that uh, what is being said and what's apparent is that existing law, the domestic law, has not really been able, the law and the jurisprudence, because we have had a number of decisions by the courts, has not really been able to protect these acknowledged and recognized rights. Uh, it, it hasn't been sufficiently sensitive. It hasn't responded adequate, adequately uh, to the rights that we know exist or should exist under international human rights law as accepted under the American Declaration, for instance. But it's the, the, the courts have interpreted uh, these the, the, these issues in a, in a very literal, very limited, very restricted way, not purposive way, which would ensure that the intent, which is to protect such rights, uh, is fulfilled. I think that's clear from the decisions that we've been made aware of. And so that's a real problem. So although the state says, okay, there are state laws and federal laws and so on, uh, I think there is an obligation on the state to strengthen the domestic law, to strengthen the mechanisms that should exist to protect those rights in, in a much more meaningful way, in a deeper way. And the particularly sticky point is where sacred sites are located on public lands. And that's a distinction that I think we need to keep in mind, uh, that although we're saying yes, um, indigenous peoples have control and so on of, the, of sites on their lands, but we are in many instances talking about public lands. And I think that's the bone of contention. That's where we need to really strengthen the law. That's where we need to strengthen the, the rights. That's where we need strong mechanisms. So to me, simply accommodating access 
as in the cases that were mentioned, to a sacred site that has already been desecrated, that has been denigrated, does not meet the obligation. So sort of a physical right of way to go to the mountains when there's a ski resort. That is meaningless in my uh, opinion. And uh, generally what we have seen, unfortunately, across the region as Rapporteur for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I've seen it far too often, where we have placed uh, greater emphasis on uh, the extractive industries, on the interests of business, big business in particular, as opposed to protecting indigenous rights, and in many cases, not just indigenous rights, but protecting the right in the environment, which is something that the commission is also interested in, economic, social, cultural rights, and which we know indigenous peoples, uh, as part of their own spirituality, also does um, protect. So we've seen many conflicts in the region, and this is another example where, in a way, um, we, we see again, and we heard of meetings behind closed doors, for instance, or big business, whereas indigenous peoples don't have that voice. That is something we see in the region. It's a pattern. It's a very disturbing pattern to us. I think, for me, it's particularly disturbing when... Uh, as opposed to some countries, some poor countries in the region, for example, where the argument is uh, that, okay, we need to have indu extractive industries for development and so on, where we're talking about not that kind of argument, but like a ski resort. That makes, in my opinion, uh, even greater mockery of, of, of rights which should be meaningful to indigenous peoples. And when there clearly has been no prior consultation, another deeply entrenched right, and no consent. And again, the, 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 the big business and those other uh, parties appear at the end of the day to have more rights than the genuine holders of, of the rights, which are indigenous peoples. And I want to agree and emphasize uh, uh, that prior consent here does mean that there's a right to say no. So there are several sticky issues. Um, so we are going to give you, we can give you three minutes each to make any further conclusions or responses. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair and, and members of the commission and also the delegation from the United States, I just wanted to preface my comment <clears throat> that the Navajo Nation is here under uh, specific direction by the Navajo Nation Council, uh, my office, and also the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department. We're here under the direction of the Navajo Nation Council by resolution. Uh, in, in 2011, when the Special Rapporteur, James Onaya, issued his report on the uh, desecration of the San Francisco Peaks, and making his, recommenda his make a recommendation in three parts. The Navajo Nation authorized the Speaker of the Council, the Navajo Nation President, and, the, and it, their designees plus the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission to do all things necessary to protect San Francisco Peaks as a sacred mountain for the Navajo people. And we have had, as mentioned earlier uh, by the lead party from the United States, uh, the Navajo Nation has filed a particular petition and we are in the process of pursuing uh, that opportunity to be heard in the international arena because the Navajo Nation believes specifically that we have not been heard, we have not been accommodated. There's been no effort being put forward to accommodate those three recommendations, specifically in, in the August 2011 recommendations from the Special Rapporteur. So <clears throat> having said that, um, I'll have um, the, the Navajo Historic Preservation to also provide additional comments. In terms of the question, how do we participate in issues that are important to these peoples? We don't get that opportunity. We are sent letters, which are contained in the Navajo Nation packet, that describe the actions that are going to happen. These actions are already planned by the federal agency. Then they come to us and ask us if this is, not even if it's okay. They let us know what's going on. We have an opportunity to comment, <coughs> and then they make the decision. We have an example of a memorandum of agreement where the Forest Service knows and understands that the San Francisco Peaks are a traditional cultural property and they wanted us to sign off on this. However, we refused to sign because this did not recognize our rights and our claims about the important and purity and the pristineness of the San Francisco Peaks. 
the only time that we are ever getting any opportunity to participate are in these so-called listening sessions. None of our, opportun none of our um, opinions are taken into consideration. They come to us after the fact. That is how we participate. Our participation is extremely limited and it's a mockery to us as a people, to our culture and our way of life. This is um, the situation with the Southeastern, Southeastern Arizona Land Exchange, something that's been proposed since the year 2005. And it's um, locally something that's been prepared for and planned by the uh, mining companies because our reservation, our <coughs> cultural territories are um, have been taken away and our lands, uh, reservations been given to us according to the size has been given to us according to the different mines and the locations of mineral areas around us. So our concern with the way things that occur are we, the things are pre-planned, things are decided already. And uh, I don't want to reiter uh, in, uh, reiterate, but, and reemphasize that we're not involved in these plans at the beginning. You know, there's, we're not involved in plans to propose road widening, you know, um, road widening projects in these areas, or we're not in, uh, invited to participate in plans with um, reroutes of highways, um, public areas. There's use of, um, there's, there's federal agencies and the state agencies, they gather and they, they consult with one another and in comes organizations that have, that are so powerful because of the money that they have, the influence they have. And this is a second situation that we're, we find ourselves in as a tribe, as a nation, because we've dealt with something similar and that was with the Mount Graham International Observatory with um, this project that was also an, an insertion of a rider into a um, conservation act that was gonna be passed unanimously by Congress. So in that situation, we dealt with a 20 year plus um, issue. We dealt with the um, different universities, other religious organizations, because they supported telescopes on top of this holy mountain. And again, with this situation, a huge mining conglomerate, a huge corporation with money, with power, has again somehow have the ability to bypass existing laws, you know, that the United States has, you know, um, created with tribes at one point, but now all that is pushed aside so that um, these mining companies can come onto United States federal lands, uh, Indian trust lands, and just buy whatever they want and take it and privatize it and extract mineral ores and take them off you know, the North American continent and take it elsewhere. We, you know, our people, when you tell them these things and things that are happening and they see it, they say, well, what are they gonna do with those minerals? What are they building there? What are they, you know, what do they want with it? These minerals are people we use in small amounts we use to pray with, like turquoise. Copper is a, is a, is a healing element as well, but not in large amounts as the way they use to extract it and take it away. We use all these minerals, they, they help us to heal. They help us to center and ground us. And it so happens that our people, it seems like, and native peoples, were concentrated above and around huge concentrations of these minerals. And some of our Indian reservation lands are situated right above these minerals. And we ask if Congress can be influenced and, and in plain words, if they can be bought so easily, um, what's gonna happen to lands? These are lands off our reservation, but what's gonna happen when it comes straight to our Indian reservation lands now that are held in trust by the government? 
we're concerned about as well. So thank you for, for asking that particular question. <clears throat> thank you, members of the commission. Uh, Madam President, you uh, pointed out uh, these are lands off of, uh, off of our federal, off, off of our trust lands, and um, that's where we look to our, our trustee to provide the protections. You know, I appreciate that um, the administration has set aside other lands that are important to the pueblos of New Mexico, but they've also demonstrated that they're also willing to allow extractive industries to have impact on that land. I think the biggest um, demonstration of that is the, the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service consideration of gas <clears throat> and oil extraction using fracturing along with uranium on lands that surround a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So, and I'm talking about the Choc Chaco Canyon Historic Site, which is a part of the Mount Taylor um, cultural landscape, very closely connected to Mount Taylor, very closely connected to many tribes of New Mexico, many of the pueblos of New Mexico. But that site in 1987 was nominated by the Department of the Interior to become a World Heritage Site. So they've demonstrated that they're willing to forego protection for places which they themselves have nominated. So, you know, again, these are off of, off of our trust land, so we look to our trustee to stand on our side of the fight to protect these places, but they've demonstrated they're willing to allow, if, I assume if the price is right, um, the even destruction of places they've nominated themselves. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Steve, would you, do you have a closing comments? I, I just have a uh, couple of quick comments um, that I'll make in response to the questions and in response to the rapporteur's uh, questions in regards to um, the interaction with the legislative branch. The legislative branch does hold hearings in, in D.C. Um, and I think there are other ways that um, individuals and, and tribal representatives can participate in that process. Um, in response to the question about um, who, who's controlling the decision about whether to extract, um, it is a complex area of land ownership, but when um, the tribe owns um, the land, uh, that it's, the decision is within uh, their control. Um, but tribal lands in many areas are a very complex set of land ownership. There is um, non-Indian <coughs> land owned within um, tribal communities, within reservations. Um, and of course, in some instances, we're talking about land adjacent to, um, to that land. Um, uh, and so that is why one of the administration's efforts is to restore homelands to tribal um, ownership as much as possible um, and is one of our initiatives. And uh, to the chair's question about um, uh, sort of uh, how, you know, what can we do better? Um, we can do better. Uh, we do aim to, to do so. Um, I think uh, one of the, the initiatives we have is on, under the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation in order to further improve the consultation process. Um, where they are hoping to um, develop guidance on some earlier coordination to um, make that consultation uh, more effective so the parties are coming together uh, sooner and develop some guidance on that under the uh, National Historic Preservation Act, which gives them authority um, uh, to do so. so. Thank you. So as we said earlier, this really is a dialogue, and I always believe that these hearings are very powerful instruments. We heard that many persons who come before us, and this is the case today, don't have a voice. They're not being listened to. So I think it is a very useful mechanism when you can sit down with people who come here in good faith, representatives of the state, and who are interested in making things better. So we are pleased to be a, 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 a vehicle, a catalyst for meaningful change. We noted your credentials, um, lead pre presenter, and I'm, I'm sure that you also have similar interests. So we, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank uh, the presenters for ensuring that we are fully informed of this issue, informing us and informing the state, and we do hope for really important progress on this issue towards human rights. Thank you so much.